good morning, my friends. It's your old pal Jordan the Lion. How are you all doing today? Excellent. Well, today we're going to take off, hit the park, let Jago play with some of his buddies, and then we're going to head over to where this famous nightclub was in the valley. The world famous Palomino. Days with Jordan the Lion begins now. Is it safe to say that you're excited you're going to the dog park today? You are? You're happy that you're going to go see your friends at the park? <laughs> okay, let's go. Next stop, the dog park. There he goes. First things first, got to pee on that hill, always. Power line park. So if the Palomino kind of sounds familiar and you've been watching my channel for a while, probably two and a half years ago I vlogged the filming locations for the Clint Eastwood classic Any Which Way But Loose and they filmed part of that at the Palomino. However, I didn't really go into all the great stories and all the great legends that are attached to the Palomino. I really just kind of talked about the movie when we were there, but while we were there they were, I think it's like a catering place now or like an event hall. They were just finishing up and they let us walk through it and I got to film and it really is laid out the same way it always was. So if we get there today and I can't go in and show you the inside, I'll grab that old footage and uh, show you so you can see how it was laid out. Now the Palomino, or the Pal as they used to call it, was a premier country club. It was actually called the most important club in the West. And um, Frank Zappa even mentions it in his song San Bernardino. What's that look supposed to mean? You're squinting at me. Okay, let's head over to where the former Palomino or the Pal was. Unfortunately, the Palomino closed in 1995, so never really got to experience any of that. Though, a year ago, they brought it back to life for one night. Well, my friends, here's the Palomino. Nothing fancy today, but back in the day, it was the place to be every single day, all day, and all night. La Mange Banquet Hall once was the Palomino, which before that, it was the Mule Kick Tavern. A man named Hank Penny was, well, Basically, back in the day, back when this all came about, North Hollywood was kind of like an outlaw area, they said. It was basically like a place where, you know, people that um, were cowboys that were looking to get into movies or be stuntmen or something like that, this was a place that they all came and it was a real kind of like Wild West environment. And at the time, it was 1949, and a man named Hank Penny, who was also in that business, he was trying to be a stuntman, he was trying to be in westerns. He drove by this place, and it was called the Mule Kick Tavern. He said, I saw a bunch of broken bar stools, and I saw broken glass and everything, so I thought, you know what, I think if we cleaned it up, we could turn it into something. And he had a lot of friends who were musicians, so that became the plan. He bought the Mule Kick, and uh, when he opened it up, it didn't particularly have a name yet. And the legend was that one of the first customers to come in was a cowboy. He hitched his horse up and came up to the bar. And um, his horse was a Palomino, so they said that that's where they came up with the name, the Palomino. Now, Hank opened this and it originally became a, um, it was partially jazz and country music. And his career started to take off, so he really couldn't, um, run the place anymore so he found two guys that had dreams of running their own club named the Thomas brothers Billy and Tommy Thomas and so they decided to basically lease it from him um, in 1952 and then Hank basically eventually just sold it to them because they turned this place into a hot spot 
So how they made it successful was, first off, they made it a neighborhood bar feel. So it opened up at 6 a.m. They had a happy hour from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. And um, what was cool about this place was they started getting country acts that nobody really wanted. People like Tanya Tucker, Waylon Jennings, Willie Nelson. This was like, you know, in the 50s and 60s when they really weren't getting booked anywhere so they could pay them very little and they would come play here. And what was cool if you were a neighborhood patron of this bar is that, you know, they just left the bar open all day long. You could get all your meals here and um, people that worked here basically became family. So if you came here and you were drinking and there was a, a band that was gonna play that night, you got to sit in and listen to the sound check. Sometimes they do a little mini concert and they said that the backstage area was always kind of an open area, pop, like an open area. So the policy was basically, if you wanted to meet anybody, you just go back there and ask them if they were receiving visitors. If they said they were, you could get autographs, go converse with them. And a lot of people started making this one of their kind of home away from homes. One of them being Jerry Lee Lewis. They said that Jerry Lee Lewis started coming here and um, one of the first times he performed, somebody in the crowd asked the bouncer and, to ask him to play a little bit quieter. So the bouncer, Tiny, went up and asked him if he could play quieter. And he said Jerry Lee Lewis kicked his bar stool out, or kicked his piano stool out, pushed the piano off the stage onto the floor, destroying the piano, and stormed off. And they said he, he did pay and uh, replaced the piano and became a mainstay here. He performed a concert here every single year from the mid 1950s until 1986 and they said everybody would come here it just became you know well for one thing sundays they would have a barbecue day where you know everybody you could bring your kids and they could all enjoy barbecue on thursdays it was an open mic night so if you were trying to get your foot in the door in country music this is a place you could come and try that and they said some of the more memorable nights for that were um, a young Linda Ronstadt before she was anybody came here and wowed the audience with a really tight sequin red sweater and some um, <laughs> tight jeans. And they also said that uh, one night as a joke, George Jones put his name in the bucket and, well, put a fake name in and went up and did the open mic night. So this became a place you could come and see Rick Nelson, you could see Marty Robbins, Willie Nelson, um, you know, various names that weren't quite major celebrities yet. And that would happen throughout the 50s and 60s. And then in the 70s, they started letting the long hairs come in and play. So what happened, the reason they let that happen was because all the country stars that they were booking for all those years had now become big names and they were charging a lot more. They were filling bigger places. At the time, this place could only hold 300 people and at its max, years later, they could only hold 400. So they started letting people like the Flying Burrito Brothers, Graham Parsons, people like that play here. And there was a really great story I found, um, an interview with Keith Richards of the Rolling Stones telling about coming here and he said, I remember coming and seeing Graham in this gristled bar. I mean, this is a place you, you did not want to go in there without a friend because he said there was a fight every single night. Somebody was going to get hurt. And he said, I remember going in there, seeing Graham dressed the way Graham dressed with, you know, these, these uh, silky satin bell bottoms. And he's playing around some really tough customers. And he goes, but Graham had this calming presence about him that when he performed on the stage, he said, you'd see even the most grizzled, um, hard nosed waitress. Uh, break down crying while he was performing and they said that there was a uh, one night that somebody came up to Graham I think it was that same night he said somebody came up to Graham and said you know I want you to meet my three brothers we were gonna beat you up after this show but you sang so well we want to buy you a beer now it's the kind of place this was now the Palomino is featured like I mentioned in every which way but loose it was also in the sequel any which way you can it was in Hooper with Burt Reynolds it was on the Fall Guy chips but uh, what ended up basically making um, the Palomino go away as it did close in uh, 95, 96 area um, was 10 years before that one of the brothers died and um, his share of the business was left to his wife who was also a waitress here. And then eventually the other brother died. Um, they just couldn't get the ax in here. They just couldn't get the clientele the world had changed and people, it, this wasn't quite a country area anymore. So they had started letting um, SST, the punk label, rent it out and they were throwing shows here. In fact, 
believe it or not, in 1992, uh, before they were really big, Green Day played here with Jughead's Revenge on like a punk show. Um, they also used to hold like political fundraisers here. They did a Jerry Brown fundraiser back in the day here. It was like a headquarters. And so um, eventually they just couldn't make a profit. And um, after the second br Thomas brother had died, um, the widow who had been helping to run it and, and everything, she just, it just wasn't working. So they ended up closing it down. And uh, unfortunately, like the legend of the Palomino kind of fell by the wayside. Except, like I mentioned, a year ago, they decided to bring it back to life for one night only, and I believe they filmed all of that. I did try and um, get authorization to come, but um, they were it was $200 per ticket, and since they were filming it, they didn't want me to film it. So I just, I couldn't justify going. And plus, all the acts that would have performed here that I would have ever wanted to see uh, were no longer around to come perform here. But one of the trademarks of this place was that the old sign used to have like a bucking bronco on it and now the original signs are at the Valley Relics Museum because after it closed, they, the signs went missing and people were like, well, you know what happened? They thought people stole them and actually they, some, the guy who owned them um, was storing them in a, um, he was storing them in a warehouse and then offered them to Tommy at Valley Relics. So that's what ended up happening to those. And another great story was they said that um, any night you came here, you never know who was gonna pop up on stage, including people like Elvis Presley performed here. They said you could come here and maybe Waylon would be performing and Chris Christopherson would get up and they would do me and Bobby McGee. But one night, Johnny Cash was performing here and somebody was heckling him from the crowd, so Johnny challenged the guy to come up on the stage and, uh, and fight him. And when the guy started walking up on the stage, Johnny took his guitar and smashed it over the guy's head. And the original microphone from here, it was a gold microphone with a gold cable. That also is in the Valley Relics Museum now. Now they are holding, if you look in the parking lot here, they're obviously having an event here today, so I can't go in and film it. So I will grab my old footage and let you see what the inside looks like. As well, you can go look at every which way but loose in any which way you can, and you can see what the interiors look like as well. But yeah, what a great place this was. What a legendary place. Pretty much anybody who is anybody in country slash rock music from the 50s to the 70s was performing here. And then the 80s punk scene from California was all here. To let you know what a rough and tumble place this really was, beyond all the stories I've told you already, um, I found a couple of interviews with the bouncers that used to work here and they said this was the kind of place that like you just you knew every single night you were gonna get getting into a fight with somebody that was just a given but they said you also knew if you lost that fight and you came back the next night that guy was gonna have your job and both of those guys worked here for some odd 25 years so that tells you how tough those guys were that worked here now the palomino became a hot spot not just for country acts and for the locals and the people in the cowboy industry and the western industry but it became a hot spot for just anybody in the entertainment industry period including they had a celebrity room here and they said this is where terry bradshaw the quarterback of the pittsburgh steelers uh came to have his debut when he was putting out a solo album Oh yeah. Now what is kind of cool is that even though it doesn't um, really look the same, it doesn't have that old corral look that it used to, it hasn't changed that much. And even though there's a new establishment here and new sign, that's pretty much the way the old sign was set up too. So you really get the feel of the old Palomino when you come by it. So it does have a little bit of that old corral feel. I'll take you down the side. I didn't really show you much of it earlier because there's not really much to see, but Nineteen forty nine to nineteen ninety five. Not a bad run. Not a bad run at all for the place that they called the most important country nightclub on the West Coast. They actually told me I can, so now it's a banquet rehearsal hall. But this is how it would have been set up and look at the stage. You can tell where the bar was. The bar was right here, where they would have all been sitting around. And uh Actually, yeah, I mean, they pretty much kept the same layout. You would have seen Philo and Orville drinking right there. And then uh, 
Philo, right around here is where he would have been sitting with the uh, woman with the clam chowder where he invites himself to sit. And then that's the famous stage. Now, one of the stories I didn't get to tell you guys was that one night, like, Bob Dylan and a handful of really famous musicians just got up and jammed one night. And um, from the time that Jerry Lee Lewis lived out here, or he would come out here and played here, he played here every year from, like, 1959 till 1987. He played a show at least once a year here. So this was the Hoyt Axton, Flying Burrito Brothers, all those famous bands. This was their... This was the place to play. And in fact, Frank Zappa mentions this song in San Bernardino. The Palomino Club. Wow, so cool. That is so cool to see that stage. Seems like a happy car wash. Look who's riding that bird scooter. Some sort of muppet or puppet or something. One of the members of Crank Anchors, I guess. Well, my friends, I have a little update for you. Since we were just at the Palomino, this kind of goes hand in hand with that. If you remember a couple of days ago in the vlog where I went to Tom Mix Death Site, the Elvis Charo Church, and um, Bobby Q's, I mentioned when we were at Bobby Q's that the man who owned that was Waylon Jennings' best friend. And that uh, I had asked if there was any way I could get in contact with him and they said that he didn't have email, he didn't do that kind of stuff. But they took my phone number and they said, if he's interested, he'll give you a call. We'll pass it along to him. Yesterday I got a call. He said he'll do it. So, um, he told me to give him a call next month. Um, give me a specific day to call him and we will set up a time for me to go back to Phoenix and we will sit down and have an interview with him uh, about Waylon Jennings, how he met Waylon, the, his life with Waylon, all the early start because it's a really great piece of Waylon's life that I don't know that much about. I know that Waylon, you know, was involved with Buddy Holly, but once Buddy Holly passed away in the airplane accident, Waylon was, you know, kind of aimless at that point because that was what he was planning on doing he was planning on going in that direction and he ended up going to um, Arizona and playing in bars there forming his own band and, and literally in interviews he said he took 10 years paying his dues paying playing every single night somewhere developing his craft and that's why he was so good so I would love to get to sit down and talk with the man that was his best friend according to Waylon's wife Jesse Coulter and um, find out what it was that he saw in Waylon that he would allow him to play there, what it was like to see him, what kind of songs he was doing. I think we'll get some really good information. So just wanted to give you a little update on that, that, that should be happening next month. Okay, you wanna talk about first world problems? I never thought I'd be talking about this, but I have to go find a music box repair shop because uh, this, when I got this, I didn't realize that it actually has a music box built into the bottom of it. And if you're going to have Graceland without playing music, what's the point? Well, not what's the point, but you might as well get it fixed if you can. So since it's a gift for somebody eventually, I really feel like I should get it fixed. And it looks like online the best place to do that is in Orange County. You just seriously can't have something that looks this cool that's supposed to play music and not. You just can't. Especially when even the freaking gates move that's too cool okay so the map says 55 minutes to get there which i assume means 55 minutes to get back and i don't think they're gonna fix both of them while i'm there so this is gonna be a four hour project to get these fixed worth of driving two trips each way yikes this is noon traffic going in both directions turns out it was like some guy's house that reminded me of doc brown from Back to the Future, he had about 8 billion parts to music boxes all over the house and books on music boxes all over the house. And so I'm guessing he's probably the guy that can fix it. If anybody can fix it, this guy can probably do it. All right, good evening, my friends. We will call it a night. Thank you all for watching. Thank you, Jamie Fondow, for becoming my newest Patreon and helping to support this channel. Thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed checking out a little bit of the... Old Palomino. What a classic place. 
Have a great night. We'll see you all tomorrow. Goodbye.